Hey everybody, Jason here from AV Pro Edge and Meridio. Happy Monday, I hope everybody had a great weekend. Uh, everybody's coming back very refreshed. Uh, it is Monday, so that means I have yet another session with Anthony Gramani. Anthony, how are you? I am doing great, and yourself? Good, good to hear, man. So um, we've had several sessions over the past few weeks, and today's one of the ones I have to be honest that I'm really the most excited about. Um, it's all about base, right? Something that we've all been chasing for years and years and years and, and uh, dynamic range being such an important part of audio and video, especially. Um, so I think this will be fun. I, I talked to you a little bit briefly about this um, last week, I think, but you know, I um, started off as a young man in the industry and I spent some years in car audio. So I do have a little bit of a uh, base head in me <laughs> a little bit. Right, so, right. so I'm really excited to learn about, um, not only base in general, but you know, subwoofers and rooms and placements and standing waves and all the all the great stuff that I've learned so far from you. I'm excited to expand that more and, and talk about some subwoofers. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. You know, and about base, I heard once. I don't know if this is true, and I should ask him. I heard that Matthew Polk once was quoted saying that half of the world is looking for God, and the other half is looking for better base. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. <laughs> so. Anyway, um, great. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to get this thing started, but hold on. My, my whole little webinar session here thing is all breaking. It's okay. Oh, we'll no. be fine. That's we'll okay. We'll make it work. Yeah. Um, as, as, uh, as some of you out there uh, may have had to do, my, my whole setup is a kludge to just make it work for this kind of application. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we make it work. It's all, right. it's all good. All right. Got it. Um, so uh, again, I do every time because I really, I really feel it's important. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that the, the guy, so, so this is fun for me to do, to share the knowledge I've kind of uh, acquired through the School of Hard Knocks and through engineering uh, sure. classes. You know, I did study engineering and through working at some of the world's top uh, audio engineering firms um, and then just going out there in the field and doing tons and tons and tons and tons of designs installations calibrations and so I'm, I'm sharing that that knowledge from from you know uh, everywhere I'd say from um, from the theory to the application and it's sure. just fun uh, you know some of you may know I I you know when I was younger and a lot more stupid but although I'm still really stupid but a, <laughs> a lot more stupid believe it or not um, I used to I used to play in rock bands. I used to go there in oh, front yeah. of of, uh, uh, of large audiences and get my yayas out that way. That's all over. I can't do that anymore. Um, and this this maybe this is the replacement of that. I, I have a great time doing this. this is yeah. But the guys from AV Pro, I, I think Jason's having a good time. He's like smiling. Look at him. And he oh, wants yeah. to find out all. But um, I again do, do want to acknowledge that you you guys are using your time, your energy, your bandwidth uh, to support this and. Um, mm -hmm. No, not trying to sell anything, uh, any particular piece of gear out of it. Just share knowledge, uh, open, open up a, a discourse in the industry. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, again, hats off. You know, big, big clap to, to you guys for supporting. <laughs> Thank this you. Thing. We, uh, you know, we we have a big philosophy at AV Pro um, that education is really the key. So uh, even when we do our live classes um, all over the country, and and now we're starting to do some in Canada and stuff. Um, you know, the, the whole point of the class is to teach people things. And we feel like if uh, the integrators are smarter and they're more confident, then the industry grows and gets better and, and we all get better. So that's kind of the philosophy behind it. So thank you for thank you for saying that. It's very nice of you. Right. Right. Now, there's there's no doubt that the 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 smarter we are about. Well, the smarter we are about the stuff, actually, in an unconscious level, I do want to I do want to clarify that our clients uh, can sense when we come in and we talk to them that there's there's a. Uh, a gravitas to use a big word. Oh, a, yeah. A, a, just a sense of knowledge, especially, you know, so I have this theory that those of us who are working in, in you know, mid to upper end integration are talking to clients who are generally successful in their lives. The mm -hmm. way they're successful in their lives is, is they've done good deals, they, they run companies, they know how to direct people. They they have the sixth sixth sense for, for what are good people and not good people. That's just sure. what it takes to be successful, along with knowing what you're doing, you know, not minding working 16 hours a day and all these other stupid things you have to do to be successful. <laughs> but um, when you walk in in front of a client and you have uh, you have knowledge that, that's imbued in you, it's like solid, it's good. When they talk to you and they look in your eyes and go, this this guy sounds and looks like he knows something. Yeah. And um, 
so for the people who are watching, you're going to spend an hour, hour and a half with me listening to bass or about bass, Jesus. Um, and <laughs> just know that that and all of the other knowledge you're getting, just, you know, if you go, what is, what, why am I wasting my time? Well, somewhere next time you're in front of a client and you're not, you know, wearing a mask and goggles and hats and all this right. other stuff, they will be able to see that you have knowledge. So th th thank, thank you for sitting through this and it'll be worth it. I, sure. I along with learning what I've learned about how to do good bass. Sure, and, and guys, as Anthony and I are kind of conversing today and he's sort of giving us a, a lesson here, uh, feel free guys, there's a, there's a question box, I'll be watching it, I've got it right here up on my other screen, so if you guys have any questions uh, as we're going along here, feel free to type those in and, and we'll address those as, as they come along. Excellent, excellent. So um, let's switch to my PowerPoint presentation. Sure. Um, and um, I, I wanna say this, this, this presentation is a kind of a one hour version of uh, what I've taught a few times at uh, Cedia, mm -hmm. um, ISE, and a few other places. It, it does actually take three hours to get through the whole conversation of how to get better base, you know, if, if you're half of the world who's looking for that. Because it's really complicated. There's a lot of chaotic factors oh, that sure. influence the quality of the base you hear. In, we're here to talk about home theaters, but the same applies to, to music systems. Um, same applies in recording studios and other places. So um, it is a, it is a three hour conversation. I've crunched it down into one hour. There's a bunch of things I've omitted and I'm just focusing on this one thing that Jason wanted to hear about, which is just how many subwoofers do you need? Just how many subwoofers? It, so uh, Jason, do you, do you have the, uh, the PowerPoint up? I don't see your screen yet. Uh, okay, okay, so I gotta hit, I gotta hit the, the, the magic button. Uh, and so, do, 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 do. so in this version, uh, here, let's do this. <laughs> Maybe now. Yeah, thank you for sending me the show my screen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Great. And as Anthony's pulling this up, I, I just kind of wanted to maybe mention um, with with, you know, especially bass, it seems like the, the point is, is to get a lot of volume and a lot of displacement. So it almost sounds like, you know, when you talk about engines and cars and racing, it's like there's no replacement for displacement. So it sounds like with bass, a lot of the stuff I've experienced in, in, in my career and, and read about and things like that, um, you can certainly have too much, but there's almost, uh, it's almost impossible to have not enough. <laughs> Something <laughs> um, like that. that. That's true. That, that's true. Uh, but just like with cars. So, uh, you know, we, those of us who are gearheads understand these analogies. You can have a big block V8 poorly tuned and that oh, thing will develop a sure. hundred horsepower or, or even 80. I mean, I've seen things develop 80 horsepower. Imagine you have a, go, a big block V8 with a missing spark plug and a carburetor that's clogged up and tuned <laughs> yeah. poorly and the advance is just like all shot and right. that thing's going to go yeah. And then you can also, out of two liters, uh, you know, the guys in Formula One, how much power are they getting out of two liters, wow. out of 2,000 cubic, uh, cubic nice. centimeters, whatever that is in cubic inches, I forget now. It's a, that's a, a basically the engine you would put in a basic Honda, okay? Right. So those those things normally, uh, you know, a, a two liter car used to be 100 horsepower, now they're more like 150 to 200. But mm -hmm. if you push it, you can get 400 horsepower out of a, out of a two liter car. Um, and if you do it right, you can actually have a car that'll go 150,000 miles on with a two liter car and put out that much horsepower. Right. Um, that's just called really good engineering. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the Subaru WRX, which is an amazing car. It looks like, a, oh, yeah. looks like it's just a piece of junk, but man, that thing goes <laughs> a tiny engine and it just puts out horsepower for days. And the all wheel drive just lets you drive like a, like a complete maniac on terrible uh, conditions and it holds. So I'm gonna actually talk about that. How do, how do you extract uh, 400 horsepower out of a two liter engine with good reliability. There's uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you a room that has four 10 inch subwoofers mm -hmm. and puts out 112 decibels Oof. because it's correctly tuned. That's that's nice. normally the domain of 18 inch subwoofers right. un under normal conditions. And normal conditions being a single subwoofer placed somewhere in the room that's not don't, doesn't have any particular tuning. And that's sort of what we getting back to to the world of gear, that's where we go. You know, we need we need six thousand cubic centimeters of of um, of engine, a big V8 to get anywhere. Well, no, if you if you do 
optimized engineering and you tune things and you eke out every inch of power out of the thing, you, you can get a lot of results without having to throw giant subwoofers at the room. Um, I don't have a problem with giant subwoofers. It's just our clients sometimes have a problem that they take up too much room. And oh, if yeah. instead of doing that, you can actually hide things in small subwoofers concealed uh, in the ceilings, walls, behind stretch fabric. Sure. It's amazing. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about the agenda. So first point is we're, we're here talking about this because, uh, because low frequencies are important. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just uh, a, a fact of the matter. Um, there, there is a uh, there's sort of a measurement in psychoacoustics uh, that that says that the the sense of quality out of a system when when you put somebody in front of a system and you and you play them play them the system and you go well how did you like it uh, about I'm forgetting it's it's something like 40 or 50 percent of the sense of quality comes mm -hmm. from the stuff below 120 hertz. So right. out of the out of the eight or ten octaves we can hear, you know, this is a range of what we can hear. Just two octaves contribute to more than half of the sense of quality. Right. And you know, not nothing makes a client more impressed that when you give them a demo and when there's bass, they can feel it and it rattles mm. the room and it's punchy. They, they just love that. That like makes the wallet come out and go, okay, I want this. Here's my credit card. When can you start? So the problem, uh, so, so bass is really cool. When it works well, people love it. Uh, challenge is that producing good bass is challenging. It's a, there's all kinds of chaos that gets in the way. And even the best subwoofers put into a room that you think is acoustically good can actually end up with uh, no bass at all, a really crappy bass. Sure. Um, there's a lot of legends about what makes bass, um, and legends being, well, I've tried this in the past, you do this, you do that, you do that, and, and, and a lot of them are not proven. Uh, a lot of them are like sort of like medications that haven't really gone through real testing. Um, I'm gonna try to dispel some of those. Um, the fact is that at the base of the issue of bass is the fact that small rooms have standing ways. So, um, I think now in these seminars, I probably talked about seminar about um, standing waves three times. I'm <laughs> going to again talk about it because it's it's a little hard to grasp, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. But the fact is that you put bass into a room, and the 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 thinking people have is just the wave passes you, it hits you, and then and then that's it. Well, that's not actually what happens in a room. The the molecules of air pass your head, they hit a wall, they come back, and they cause this elastic mush in the room in the base frequencies that cause uh, conditions where you could have a seat where there's no base, you could have another seat where there's a lot of base but only at one note, um, and lots of other problems. So we'll talk about that. Um, now, in the issues of getting good base, uh, there is a headroom issue. I see a lot of systems out there. You know, you, you talked about uh, having enough displacement. Well, the fact is there's a certain amount of bass you need to be able to play to play a film soundtrack without the subwoofers overloading too much. And uh, that magic number is actually 115. If you can play 115 decibels of bass below 100 hertz in the room, which, is, which takes a fair amount of cone area, you'll play at everything and anything that's in the film soundtrack. Uh, you may as well have a little bit of extra headroom in case the your customer wants to crank it up a little bit to, to impress his or her friends. Um, but I see a lot of systems out there built with a pretty big room and a single 12 inch subwoofer, a good one, but that's just not enough. So somewhere mm -hmm. along the way, we're gonna weave a conversation of how much is enough to get there. So uh, there's a lot of solutions to the, the issues and challenges, uh, but they're often ignored. So I, I again wanna give a plug to my, my good friend, Todd Welty, uh, the doctor of subwoofer who has done a lot of research on interaction of subwoofers in rooms, standing ways, uh, modal conditions, all this other this stuff. He got his doctorate in this. He's published great papers, both at the scientific level and at the more kind of consumer level. And he's been doing this for over 20 years. And it's amazing that here's a guy who's just teaching people how to double the quality of your base and, and not enough people are listening. So, hmm. um, Pay attention. So a lot of what I'm going to be uh, spewing here is the result of my work, but also the very inspired result of Todd Welty's work and his guidance scientifically. So thanks, thanks again, Todd, for your excellent work. Um, so uh, about me, I now run three companies, one called Gramani Systems, one PMI Engineering, one called Dimension 4. Gramani Systems makes kick-ass speakers that put out really good bass. PMI Engineering designs rooms and calibrates them. Dimension 4 Acoustics makes and sells acoustical treatments to put in your room. 
Um, I have a degree in electrical engineering. I spent five years at Dolby, 10 years at THX. Uh, 20 years ago, actually now 21 years ago, I, I left all of that to start my own company and I'm, I've got the freedom to go wherever I want, whenever I want, which is usually my office for about 16 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. um, but hey, I'm having fun. This is fun is. stuff, so I, I don't mind it. Um, let's see, I'm a CDF fellow. I've done the, I've got the top instructor award, which is like this cute little star that you get. <laughs> I'm an AES member. I have six patents. More importantly, I have two kids. I play guitar, saxophone. I have an airplane, an old Morris car, many <laughs> bicycles, and too many other toys. So that's the fun story hobbies. of my life. In a, <laughs> way too many hobbies, way too many. Um, Okay, so this is an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a bunch of background and data about how to produce space in a room so we can talk about how how do you know where to put subwoofer, well, how many subwoofers are enough and where you put them. Uh, we're going to talk about room dimensions. We're going to talk about room uh, base damping. Uh, we're going to talk about seating locations. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what subwoofers to pick and uh, where to put them. And then in the end, a little bit about the tuning of all of that uh, on a very cursory level to be able to get to this point that Jason wants to hear about is how to get to, to base nirvana. <laughs> so first of all, background and data. Uh, base matters. So these are both matters of base, but base does matter. Uh, it's, a, it's what they call a, a, a play on words. Um, so uh, I found this on the, net, on the internet. Somebody is actually nutty enough about base that they, they uh, tattooed a base clef on their arm. Uh, I'm not there yet. I don't know, Jason, if you're going to do this, uh, if you're that much into it. But um, <laughs> I do have a tube. That, <laughs> I do have my vacuum tube. <laughs> uh, vacuum. OK. Yeah. The guy's a nut. Um, <laughs> So, and, and, and vacuum teams could put out good bass under the right conditions. Um, so audiences love bass, uh, kids love bass, buyers mm -hmm. love bass. Uh, it is tactile uh, and it's hard to do. And mm -hmm. we, we have to manage the process. You can't just put a subwoofer, throw it into a corner of a room and hope you're gonna get good bass. That's right. just not and, gonna work. That's, and honestly, Anthony, doing, that's, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say real quick, that's what I see. You know, I, I do a lot of video calibration for private clients and yeah. you know, eight out of the 10 rooms I go to, it's just a subwoofer in the corner. Yeah, It's like, ooh, yep. can we talk about this um, for a second? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and so doing doing that is actually, I would say akin to buying a lottery ticket and, and hoping you're gonna make it right. rich. You, you may, you know, there are, you once might. in a while, somebody actually gets, you know, hits the big jackpot and they, they make mm -hmm. it rich. And once in a while, you will put a subwoofer randomly in a room and the chaos will actually work in your favor. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the statistics of that are, but I would say it's a it's one in a hundred thousand. Um, so I don't know. Good luck with that. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about actually instead of relying on lottery tickets, actually, you know how to how to make it rich with good base by managing the process. So um, here's the matters we care about: base extension. We want to make sure the base is nice and full range and goes you know way down to 20 hertz if possible. We care about the balance of the base, which is uh, the amount of base compared to the mids and highs. There is such a thing as too loud of a bass. There is such a thing as too quiet of a bass. It needs to be layered in at just the right point so that the film soundtrack and the music comes in right. Right. Um, we care about bass quality, which is that all of the notes are appropriately loud. They're all at the same level. That would be known as frequency response. And then we also care in bass quality that the transients are tight so that the 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 energy is bo is not boomy, but it's it's tight and that relates to frequency response, it's normally known as uh, as impulse response. The two are actually in integrally related. So, um, and so we want all of that. We want a base extension, good balance of base, good base quality from both a frequency and a time domain uh, character. And we want that at all of the listeners in the room. If a home theater is built with eight seats, everybody really should have the same quality and that's where things get really complicated. So. Um, let's talk about home cinema base issues. Uh, there are boundary conditions. That's a condition where if you put a single subwoofer over here, the sound is going to go to the listener and there'll be a reflection off here, a reflection off there, a reflection off there. They're, they're not actually usually much of an issue in the, in the base frequencies that we're talking about in subwoofers. They certainly are for speakers, but in subwoofers, eh. Um, Another issue is headroom. I already talked about that. You got to make sure that the thing plays loud enough. You need to pick where you're going to set the crossover. We'll talk about that actually towards the end. Um, and then you need to be assured that the localization of where you put the subwoofers is is not an issue. So I'll say this about localization. There's people that go, I don't like subwoofers because I can hear where they are. Right. Really? Um, well, research shows, I always love saying that, research shows, <laughs> research done by people who are very smart, much smarter than most of us on this call, uh, have, have shown that most human beings 
start to hear localization of subwoofers at 180 hertz and above. So if you put a subwoofer in a place in a room and you put a speaker over there and you separate the two, the speaker is playing actually the most sensitive signal is male voice. Mm -hmm. um, and you change the crossover, gradually raising the subwoofer frequency, cr the crossover frequency. It's at 180 hertz if you put the subwoofer, where's my hand here? If you put the subwoofer to your side and the speaker in front of you, it's at 180 hertz way up there that you can go, you know, something's not right anymore compared to a full range speaker. That's surprisingly kind of high. That's remarkably high. Yeah. 180. And guess what? So Bose exploited this many, 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 many years ago. We're talking 30 years ago when they came out with their acoustic mass system, the mm -hmm. tiny little cubes with the what they call oh, yeah. the base module. The crossover was at, at 180 hertz because they figured that's the highest they can get away with. And that allows you to make really small speakers that crank mm -hmm. a lot of sound. And that's that's not excellent quality, but most people can't tell that the, the base modules over here and the speakers are over there. So that's in the statistics. Now, at 120, let's just say 125 hertz, I forget exactly the, the number. At 125 hertz is where statistically people, uh, not the majority of people, but where the mean of people start to go, I think there's something different between a full range speaker and the subwoofer. Um, so if you wanna make sure that nobody hears or, or a few number of people hear that you have a subwoofer at a different place than a speaker, all you have to do is to cross it over at 125 hertz. Um, and then two standard deviations below that mean is 80 hertz. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where uh, very, very few people, something like 1% or less of the people can tell that there's a displacement between the subwoofer and the speaker. So if you cross over at 80 hertz, uh, the localization of the subwoofer will be like, forget about it. Like a, a very tiny minority of people may be able to tell that it's off. If you cross over at 120, 25 hertz, which is really high, um, and most people don't cross over that high. But if you went up that high, you're starting to get to a point where some people will be able to hear that it's not a full range speaker. And if you cross over at 180, the majority of people are gonna start to hear that it's that it's not in the right place. So you have a lot of latitude in terms mm -hmm. of where you cross over. Now, when people do hear subwoofers localizing, what they're hearing is either distortion, noise, uh, port noise, other side effects of subwoofers if they're not very good subwoofers. So if you, use a good subwoofer and it's crossed over with a proper slope, like let's say fourth order, 20, 40 dB per octave, don't, don't worry about localization. It is not an issue. Um, worry about standing ways because where you may have a client that on a good day may be able to hear that that subwoofer that's crossed over at 100 hertz maybe is over there. Everybody's going to hear because of standing waves that there's a hole at 60 hertz right at the seat position. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and everybody can hear that when you're not in the hold and you're, you're somewhere else, that same 60 hertz is resonating in the room for a long time. So worry about that. Now, um, legend number one, bass is non-directional. You can put the subwoofer anywhere. Really? I'd love to believe that. That is true outdoors, mm -hmm. where there's no standing waste because there's no walls around no you. No walls, yeah. And there's no walls. And if there's no walls, you can put a base bin, as it's often called in the pro audio side, you can put a subwoofer here or there or there or there. And as long as it's crossed over, let's say below 120 Hertz, you're not gonna really hear that it's not right in front of the stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're talking about home theaters. We're talking about places that have room. So let me actually show you what happens in reality. So here's, I've, I've actually shown this uh, I, I want to say a month ago when we started this. Uh, I'm going to show it again, but I'm going to expand it. So this is a an actual room in which I put the subwoofer in five locations where you say you can put it anywhere. Well, mm -hmm. let's look at the resulting frequency response in the range from 20 hertz to 200 hertz. Let's take a look. So first off, let's pick a decent subwoofer. Um, you know, free plug. This is a triad uh, silver subwoofer. Uh, it's got an aluminum cone, lots of excursions, a 15-inch nice. driver, puts out a ton of ton of bass, really good subwoofer for the money. Um, it's got a good near field response. And this is actually the subwoofer being measured with a good test microphone in what's called a near field. So the, the microphone's right in the cone um, using an impulse response method. Here's the frequency response of that subwoofer. So what this line means for people who are not used to seeing what's called a frequency response, actually the, the real term is amplitude on the left side versus frequency on the bo bottom side. And what you do here, roughly speaking, is you run a, you play a sweep through the subwoofer that goes through the frequencies boo, that it's that it plays. Um, and of course, I can't sing down to 20 hertz, sorry. 
Um, but the, you, you put a sweep through the subwoofer via generator, and the microphone measures what comes off that sweep. Mm -hmm. The sweep is, is changing frequencies that are, uh, that are putting a signal into the subwoofer that's always the same voltage. So what's going in the subwoofer is equal voltage at all frequencies as it's going up, and then you measure what comes back out of it. That's called a, an amplitude versus frequency. And what you're seeing here is that from 20 hertz up to about 300 hertz, the deviation is plus and minus one decibel. It's a very good subwoofer. That's excellent, It happens yeah. to also play loud. And when it's playing really loud, it doesn't have any funny noises or side effects, so you can't really localize this thing. So that's a good subwoofer. Um, good. Now, let's take that subwoofer and put it in the front left of the room. Uh, it just happens, I've, I've chosen to put it at where you would put a left speaker, which shows you two things. One, what's gonna happen when you put it in the room, and also what happens if you, instead of using a subwoofer, you use a full range speaker, quote unquote full range, it went down, down to 20 hertz. Let's run the same sweep from 20 to, to, to 200 hertz at the seating position. So this is an actual picture of, of the room. There's that same subwoofer. Notice it's sitting on a dolly so I don't break my back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's the same microphone. We've taken that same subwoofer that in the earlier picture was outside in the parking lot. Now it's in the room with walls surrounding it. Not a particularly stiff room. It's regular 5-8 sheet rock on studs, nothing crazy. It's a room that's five meters by four meters by 2.75 in the metric system. It's 16 by 13 by nine Ooh. in the imperial system. The one that, you know, we're still trying to remember the size of <laughs> the thumbs and legs and feet of, people, of kings and queens. I still um, get it. <laughs> tradition. It's mm. just tradition. Um, so here's the frequency response of that same subwoofer mm. put in that room. Ouchie. So we had this, right? Ooh. That's what it was. Sorry. This is what it was outside. So without walls around it. And now this is what it is inside. Oh, man. So 50 hertz just got clobbered. 52 hertz is gone. So yeah. interestingly enough, from 10 hertz, 20 hertz, up to 30 hertz, it is like it was outside, um, which really actually means that the room is behaving at low frequency. It's not behaving with any resonances. It's kind of behaving anechoically. What's really happening is that the walls are transmitting all the bass out. There's no, there's no modal constraint. The dimension between the walls uh, is shorter than the standing waves. Then there's a peak, then there's a dip, a peak, a dip, a peak, a peak, a dip. And this, this thing that was a nice even response from 20 to 200 hertz has an error of 38 decibels from peak to peak. So the Yikes. difference between 52 hertz here and whatever this is, around 36, 37 hertz, is 38 decibels. That means that the level, the difference between the level here and here is close to 99%. Mm. Um, so decibels, of, of course, is a, is a logarithmic uh, expression of a ratio, but the ratio is uh, uh, 1 to 99. So this is 1% of the sound level that was there. And, and then it goes and up and down and up and down. Anthony, I'm sorry, what's a, what's a kick drum typically? What frequency? Ah, you, you very good. That so, I remember. Um, kick drum is right around here. It is right. I, I thought it was right around 50 or 60. Oof. It's right around here. So in this room at the seating location, you put up, you know, your favorite rock drummer, um, whoever that is. I'm not going to name any names because then we get into an argument. It's just classic <laughs> oh boy. Rock, modern rock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. a, a decent... Decent kick drum, 22 by 18, 22 diameter, 18 long is going to have a resonance somewhere around 52 to 55. It's going to be gone. That bass will have no hit. You'll mm -hmm. only hear the mallet. Not good. Um, now, let's take that same subwoofer on its dolly. By the way, don't break your back. Move it over to the center location, and let's take a look. So this is a picture of that thing. Sorry. So just to prove to you, I did this. There's the subwoofer. Here it is in the middle of the room. Um, and there's a response at the center location. Uh, from 20 to 200 hertz, we have a 28 dB error. It's not mm -hmm. as bad as in the left, but it's not good. 28 dB uh, means that this, this level is about 3% 3, 3 of what was there before as opposed to 1%. It's still not good. Um, and then we move the subwoofer to the right. Uh, let's take a look. Here's the response at the right. So I moved it over, and here's the result there. Uh, 20 dB error. So better than before, but still not great. Um, so a few things to note are neither of those three are good. Mm -hmm. um, this, I'm now superimposing the left, the center, and the right in this mm -hmm. room. They all have an error somewhere around here. They all have a peak there. Um, the right location also has a dip at 30 hertz. Note mm. that this room is symmetrical. It's just a rectangular room. Sure. 
And for some reason, the response of the subwoofer on the left is different to the response to the of the subwoofer on the right. Mm -hmm. Go figure. What's that from? Um, would it have to do with the distance from the wall that the screen is on? How deep into it's, the room it, it is? is it, it is symmetrical. So I'm going to go back to the picture. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a rhetorical subwoofers. question, by the way. And I have to go back several slides. I should have a slide so I don't have to do this. Ah, uh, okay, we're getting there, Sorry, guys. So the location that I put the left subwoofer and the right, the, the left location and the right location are completely symmetrical in the room. Same distance right. to the front wall, to the right wall. Everything is the same. And you would think from the legends out there um, that it would come out the same. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. Um, and that's called chaos. And now the chaos that we're talking about in this case um, is the left wall is built slightly different to the right wall. The door is not quite in the right in the same place. This where yeah. the studs were put is different. So there's a bunch of stuff uh, that's changed uh, uh, physically in the room, and that results in different response. Um, so uh, noticing that my picture's gone a little dark. Is it? Does it look darker to you? No, you're okay. Okay, you're fine on this, um, you're on this end. All right. So now let's go forward. So this is. This is a real condition. Now let's keep mm -hmm. going. Let's look. So uh, as you can see, you can't just put a subwoofer anywhere. You're gonna end right. up with response errors and they're all gonna be different depending on where you put it. So if you had no choice than those three locations, cause your client said, it's gonna go here, here, or here. I don't, you can do anything you want as long as it's those three locations. Well, there is a location that sucks less. Mm -hmm. That's at the right speaker. That is not, not great, but it, it's all also not 38 dB of error. I guess with an equalizer, you could lock, knock down this peak. You could try to push up this dip. I don't think you'll get a lot of gain out of that. You maybe will get a little bit of gain below and above that frequency, but you can make this suck less. Mm -hmm. um, but if you did not use uh, measurements and uh, some qualitative process here, you, you just wouldn't know what you're doing. So um, now just for, for giggles, um, I also put the subwoofers at the surround locations in the room, just you know, looking at what would happen if you had full range speakers all the way around or other locations. And here's a response of the surround at the surround locations: uh, 20, 20 dB peak to peak errors, still bad. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, do we agree that we have a problem? Oh yeah, we have a problem, right? You can't just put a subwoofer anywhere and hope to get good bass. It just doesn't work. And the solution is a multi-part process. Uh, let's first understand where it's all coming from. So I'm going to quickly run through this business of standing waves again. I've already talked about it a few times, but I, as a reminder, standing waves are going to happen if you have walls around your subwoofers or mm -hmm. your speakers. And they're just, they're, they're the result resonances that are going back and forth between the front and Resonances depending on the distances between the front and back wall, left and right wall, ceiling and floor. And so what I've got here is a condition that's going to generate a standing wave, which is a wave that fits entirely within the room. Um, also, if the if a half a wave fits in the room, you're going to have a standing wave. If one and a half waves did sit in, sit, fit inside the room, you're going to have a standing wave. If two waves stand, fit in the, inside the room, you're going to have a standing wave. So. The result of standing wave is these resonances that uh, give you an uneven frequency response, poor bass impact, different bass at every room. And typically most of the rooms we're working in, they, the problems are between 30 Hertz and 150 Hertz. So how do they develop? Very simply again, if you had a room with three, three sided, uh, a three sided room, so a front wall, left wall, a right wall, and no back wall, and you generated bass at the front, the bass would go out the back and there won't be a standing wave between the front and back of the room. There will be one between the left and right and ceiling and floor, but from the front to back, there's not going to be a standing wave. There is a standing wave when the when the energy bounces back off the wall, and mm -hmm. that over time, as the pressure that the woofer puts on the air molecules goes from positive to negative to positive to negative, which is how you get sound. That's what's going on over here. This is the this is a representation of air pressure. And that's how you hear sound. So the air pressure is going is starting at zero when the subwoofer is at rest, 
And then the subwoofer kicks out into the room, you get positive, it goes back to rest, it pulls into the cabinet, it goes negative, positive. Those waves propagate back and forth and back and forth. And in this propagation, you end up with this node in the middle, which is a place where there's no change of that height of pressure. So here there's sound on the, uh, this would be, let's say the front wall where the subwoofers are, this would be the back wall there's sound. And in the middle of the room, there's no sound because there's no change of pressure with time. So there's a null there. If you had a different frequency in that same room and it first leaked out because you had the a giant wall open somehow, you had a big sliding panel, and then you close the panel, the that particular frequency won't come back at an overlap point and there won't be a standing wave, okay? So there is a standing wave when, first standing wave happens when the wave is twice as long as the room and you end up with a null in the middle. So this is the actual, wave of sound, and this is the resulting sound energy. Um, but you also have a standing wave when the, when the wave fits entirely in the room, you end up with two nulls, one at a quarter, one at three quarter. You have a standing wave when a one and a half waves fit in the room and you end up with three nulls, one six, mm -hmm. um, three six, which is also a half, and then five six. And you also have a standing wave when you can fit two waves in the room, and then there's, uh, one, two, three, four nulls. And then you also have a standing wave at, at when two and a half waves and three waves, et cetera, fit. What tends mm -hmm. to happen in most of the rooms we're working with is once you get past this, which is called a fourth harmonic, the gain of the standing waves is not is not as strong. And so while you can still measure it, it is not as big of an issue. So for what we're gonna worry about here, which is the biggest core issue, I'm not talking about uh, fine audio file issues. I'm talking about core things, which is mm -hmm. not sitting at a place where there's no 60 hertz. Um, at that, under those conditions, we're going to worry about the first four harmonics. So, um, here's uh, getting out of just raw diagrams. Here's a diagram of a room seen from the side where you put a subwoofer in the front. Your client sitting over here, three quarters of the way back in the room. Um, what's interesting. Um, about the way standing waves build is that right at this node, there's an inversion of the sound pressure. If I went back to the other diagram, you'll see that where when the sound, when the wave is going down this way, um, it's it's a positive pressure on the opposite side. So the thing to know about standing waves is when when it's a real standing wave, right at the null is an inversion of the acoustic polarity in the room. Um, and uh, I had talked about this before. If you actually were to play a standing wave in a room and you stood in this room, in the node of the standing wave, stand in the standing wave, with your head turned laterally, you'd actually hear the difference in pressure between the left yeah. and right ear. You'd actually hear that out of phase kind of character. Yeah. So we're gonna use that to our advantage. And, and everything I'm gonna talk about, where to put the subwoofers is all about this. It's about getting around or since the standing wave is always gonna be there, you can't get rid of it until you get rid of the walls. Right. Uh, we're gonna talk about how not to sit in this place, which is move the seat somewhere else. And we're gonna talk about driving these two waves in opposite or in equal directions to avoid them going opposite. So I'll get back to that. So this is a, a room view, view from the top. Uh, this is playing that same condition we had before. Uh, the room is actually flipped backwards from the earlier picture. Here's our speaker, very, very uh, schematic here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and at a second harmonic, a standing wave, it, the sound will be loud at the front wall, it'll be loud in the middle, it'll be loud on the back wall, but right where you wanna put your couch, it's gonna be quiet, okay? And that's what I'm re representing over here. So uh, the pressure polarity changes at the node. If it's not a standing wave, it won't change. It'll just be a null and it'll continue back in the other direction. Um, and we're gonna use that. Um, it changes this way in the first harmonic, it changes this way in the second harmonic. So there's a plus, a, no, a node, the null, it's called a node, um, a minus and a plus. At the third harmonic, we have plus, minus, plus, minus, and the fourth harmonic have plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So um, I will mention that in addition to just having these uh, nulls of energy at some parts in the of the room, when you're not in the null, you're gonna experience these resonances. The resonance is like the string on a guitar that goes ring and rings for a long time. Um, and on a really good guitar, uh, like the one in Spinal Tap, it can just ring and ring and ring and ring. Yeah. And some of the better guitars I've played, I would say 
probably sustain up, up to 10 seconds for a really, really well-built guitar sure. that's really solid, everything being nice and tight. So here's a room decay plot um, that shows a room that has a null. So this is 30 hertz, that's 100 hertz, and this is the decay over 800 milliseconds. So this particular room has a null, let's say around 50, and has a peak at 60, another little null, another peak at 65. And that's the peak. Um, what you will see here is that the decay gets lengthened. So these are non-resonant frequencies right here. The energy holds for maybe 30, 40 milliseconds and then falls off at an even slope. Over here falls off at an even slope. But over here, you'll notice that the curve is just a, is hanging a lot longer. And what that does is that at the seat positions where you don't have a null, you end up with this long resonance. So uh, you, you talked about kick drums. The, 52 hertz of a kick drum that you want to hear, and it's going away um, if you have a null. Well, if you sit one seat to the left or forward where you hear the kick drum again, it, you have the other problem, which is the kick drum, instead of being nice and tight and punchy, just goes boom, boom. boom. Yeah. It, 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 like, it just blooms in the room, and there's no sense of, uh, of punchiness or mm -hmm. dynamic. So not good. Not good. Um, so uh, Jason, a little while ago, we uh, we had this issue with my laptop where gradually I can see that my 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 picture is getting darker and darker and darker. Hmm. Uh, give me a quick second yeah, to deal with that. I think on, on my side it's okay. That's that's funny. It's happening on your okay, side. Huh? That's let okay. Me, let me just do a quick thing here. Yeah, I find sure. that if I turn this on and then turn a go figure. Oh, there it goes. So <laughs> all that I did, and now I'm now. totally blocked out. <laughs> So what I did is turned on the, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand where it is in, in the computer interface of this whole thing, but there's a camera yeah. application that's interfering with this thing. Now I'm completely uh, blasted out. And since we care about the quality of what we do, uh, y'all are gonna have to give me a second to adjust my video. No, that's, um, that's quite Jason all right. Jason has seen me um, do this. That's <laughs> Jason, okay. and talk while I do this. Yeah, while you're, uh, while you're doing that, there were a couple questions that came in. Um, and guys, yeah. uh, there's a few of these that are probably take a couple minutes to kind of explain, so. Um, Joey mentioned that uh, in some movies, is it true that they're having some? Uh, oh, he says I've read that some movies have bass down to three hertz. Is that uh, is that reproduction actually capable in a typical sized home theater, uh, dedicated home theater room? Three is low. Uh, that's a great. <laughs> three is low. <laughs> three is low. Uh, how low can you go? Um, right. So hey, hold on one second. I'm I'm setting the exposure on this camera. I, I'm thinking I'm looking a little bit, you know, less like a ghost. We're all good with this. All <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, all all of y'all who are ISF geeks will appreciate what I just did. The other <laughs> ones are just like, what is this guy doing? We're here to talk about uh, you know audio. Jesus. Um, so uh, here's what's interesting is is the film formats. Dol uh, Dolby Digital DTS all have bandwidth that can go down to three hertz. Right. Okay. Um, and so that's that's available in the electronics in the actual recording format. Um, there's not actually uh, so a, a lot of electronic systems won't reproduce three hertz. So the actual input of the analog device that is uh, usually capacitor coupled is usually going to die out below 20 to, to 15 hertz. Um, now you can certainly generate uh, you can certainly generate three hertz. Um, through, through synthesizers, through other means, you can certainly do that and you can certainly try to play that. Next thing is, will the subwoofer in the mix room for one and in the theater actually play that to where it's heard? And I don't know of many subwoofers that'll play down to three hertz. Um, so then you go, well, how low do it go? So here's an exception. So many, 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 many years ago, uh, I was actually uh, really young. Uh, there was a movie called Earthquake that came out in which, mm. um, it was Sirwin Vega made these subwoofers that played down to, I think it was six or eight hertz. And the, yeah. the you know, you're watching this movie, yeah. suddenly there's an earthquake that happens, and you know, the woman with really curly hair in the 70s were all like, ah, earthquake! <laughs> yeah. And everybody was running out of buildings that were crashing and collapsing. So, so that was that was a totally different format that you know was a, like a, an amusement ride in which the special subwoofers were put in the front of the room to generate that. Um, so that's an exception. Most subwoofers I know play down to about 18 or 20 hertz and then they mm -hmm. stop. This is in movie theaters and screening rooms uh, for for the professional industry. So does that mean that there's nothing below that? Not really. There are cases uh, of films in which there's content down to 16 or 12 hertz. I, I haven't heard of anything that goes down to three hertz. So if anybody mm -hmm. out there um, 
has knows of a movie that does that, please do let me know. You know, send a little note in the question box. Sure. Um, so, I would say that if you if you can convince your client to put enough money into bigger subwoofers and do the right thing, try to make it down to 16 hertz because there is some content there in rare rare cases. Um, if not, try to make it down to 25 hertz because I can guarantee there's plenty of content there. And if not, try to make it down to 30 because um, if you actually like were to draw a statistical curve of uh, the occurrence of energy, below 30, there's just not a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in certainly in music and in movies, there there are cases. Of course, there's exceptions where where film mixers have put subharmonic stuff down there under the 16 to 20 hertz. It's just pretty rare. Um, Joey mentions uh, Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds goes down real low, and then also Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings dips down to about five hertz. It looks like maybe. Uh huh. Okay, yeah. I'll have to look yeah. into that. That's, yeah. uh, that cool. sounds fun. And then the question is how uh, how how'd you know? Did you measure yeah. that with an analyzer? To, uh, let me know how, how you found out. Is it sure. uh, is it hearsay, uh, or did somebody actually put an analyzer on there or talk to the mixer? Uh, who I, I think I can get a hold of the guy and, and find oh. out. So that's that would that's fun. So what happens at five hertz is of course is you're not hearing bass. It's like moving you're feeling the room. It. Right. Um, so you're feeling it. And the cool thing is at five hertz in most rooms, unless you have a concrete bunker in a really big room, there are no standing wave issues. So all you have to have is like a big ass 24 inch subwoofer with lots of power in the front of the room and it will play that five hertz without any trouble at all. Okay, so um, I'm back on my uh, screen. Do you see that? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so uh, let's talk about solutions to all of this mess. Um, so. Uh, to get good, before we talk about, you know, how many subwoofers we need, let's talk about room dimensions, some base damping, some seating locations, and then subwoofers and, lo and numbers and stuff like that. So, um, so in terms of room dimensions, um, you know, you don't always have full flexibility of what you're going to design a room. How much room do you have? How much room did the architect give you? How much room do you need based on how many seats the client may say they want? Like if a client says, uh, the room's 16 feet long, but I want to sit 25 people in there. The answer is no. You, there's no room for 25 people comfortably in there. So in the room dimensioning, you know, you need to know how much room the client and the architect are giving you. Uh, how much room do you need based on the client's dream for how many people you can sit in there? And then you got to, around all that, you have to consider standing waves. So um, remember that standing waves are always going to happen in the front to back, left to right, top to bottom. And sometimes actually, interestingly, in interactions in waves that go front to back and then bounce laterally and then go back this way and bounce front to back um, or front to back and then uh, ceiling and floor. Those uh, oblique waves as they're called are, are they exist but they, they're not as audible and then tangential ones are ones where there's an interaction between the front and back, the left and right and the top and bottom. So just for the record, when, if you actually get out there and look for, stand, uh, for uh, standing wave prediction algorithms, you'll see what's called axial standing waves. You'll see oblique and you'll see tangential. Only worry about the axial ones, the, the single dimension ones. So what you want to do is to, if you can, if you're lucky enough to dimension a room, you want to make sure that the room is not 16 by 16 by 16. You also want to make sure that the room is not 32 by 16 by 8 because with that, that has a common denominator, you can actually have a standing wave that's subjectionable. So uh, what you want to avoid is a condition like this, where there's a front to back standing wave at a frequency, and at, at, uh, at that same frequency, there's a left to right standing wave. So this is a case of a room that would be um, about, tw uh, let, let's say it's a room that's 20 by 10, which would be a really weird room. Uh, but at 20 by 10, at a, at a certain frequency, in this case 50 hertz, you end up with a null from left to right and a null from front to back. It's a double whammy. Don't do that. Um, but by the same token, uh, obviously a, a null at the same frequency is bad. But what happens if there's a resonance at 50 hertz and a resonance at 60 hertz? Those are not so far from each other. That's That difference of 10 hertz is uh, in 50 hertz, that's 20%, and that's considered acceptable in terms of how the proximity. Um, at 50 hertz, you want to, you, you basically, sorry, I'm not saying this right, you basically want to stay away from a proximity of 5%. So if you have a resonance at 50 hertz, you don't want any other resonance within about two and a half or three hertz up or down. Okay, that's 5%. So uh, you can calculate all this with the these uh, uh, equations in the metric system. 
in the uh, the foot and inch system, also known as the imperial or standard. Um, and then you can pr look at where the resonances would be based on your length, width, and height. And just like I said here, make sure that, that there's no frequencies that are closer than 5% from each other. So um, you can do this by using this thing called a calculator that's on your phone. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. You can build a little spreadsheet, or you can download spreadsheets from many different people. Here's a list of places you can get them. I'm sure there's other ones out there too. We built our own spreadsheet years ago that has a lot of different info. I'm not going to spend too much time. Let's talk about the next legend. So there's a legend that says that if the room doesn't have parallel walls and it's odd shaped, there's no standing waves. That is a lie. It's not true. Uh, there's plenty of data out there from scientists that show there's plenty of standing waves. The problem is that the standing waves are not evenly arranged in lines from front to back or left to right. So it's hard to know where they're going to be. It's hard to know where you're going to sit and it's hard to fix them. So don't build a room that looks like this and don't build a room that looks like that known mm -hmm. as the, either the, the coffin shape or somebody on one of the sessions earlier had another name for this. Um, oh yeah, you're right. And I can't remember Jason, either. Somebody mentioned them. Yeah, it was good. So I if you look at, at recording studio control rooms, there's a lot of people who design rooms like this based on uh, acoustical approaches from the 60s and 70s. Uh, and look, that's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't help with either standing waves or room echoes or reflections. It's, and, and meanwhile, you've lost all of this real estate, all of that real estate, don't bother. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Now, you can build a room that looks like this, but in which the real room is, is a, a rectangle and in which this is stretch fabric and behind here, you put big areas of low frequency absorption. That's cool. But really the acoustical envelope is a rectangle. Just stick to rectangles, they, they work fine. So next strategy, after you've, you've figured out room dimensions that don't have strong standing wave overlaps is try to, try to put some uh, absorption in the base. So standard absorption using fiberglass or foam or rock wool, is not going to work very well because it needs to be really thick. You need to catch about a quarter of the wave, which if you're if you're dealing with 100 hertz, a 100 hertz wave is about 10 foot long. Half of the wave is five feet. A quarter is two and a half feet. If you're dealing with 50 50 hertz, a quarter is five foot. So in order, if you have a 50 hertz problem like the one, I, a lot of these diagrams are going to show rooms that have 50 and 60 hertz problems because that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to treat 50 hertz with an absorber panel, like a you know a fiberglass panel that you buy from somebody, that thing would actually have to be, anybody follow my, my argument? So 50 hertz is a 20 foot wavelength, half a wave is 10 feet, a quarter wave is five feet. So you need a five foot thick panel. Not Oof. practical, sorry, not practical. Unless you do that thing I said, which is, hey, you could build a room that looks like this, and, and in the five foot of this corner in the back and here and here, you could put absorption. That's a way to get rid of some uh, base standing waves. But in the normal conditions, what's called frictional absorption, which is what fiberglass or foam do, is not going to work. However, um, oh, uh, this is a little diagram that shows that thing. If you had a room with a standing wave pattern like this, where your client's sitting here with a frown, like, man, I'm not hearing any 50 hertz, uh, and you put a big chunk, five foot thick, of fiberglass over the whole front of the room, uh, you're going to end up getting rid of a fair amount of the standing wave. So the resulting sound pressure level would look like this, much better. It's just not practical. Now, you can, however, put like a two or three inch thick panel at the knoll over here, which is still five foot into the room. You could put it at the knoll, <coughs> pardon me, and absorb that standing wave. Uh, the physics of that are kind of complicated. It's that the point over here that has no sound pressure, no pressure, has high particle velocity. PV equals NRT, if you guys remember that from high school physics or chemistry. Um, this is a place where if you put an absorber, it will do something, except that now it's five foot into the room. Mm -hmm. um, so can you do that? Well, let's say your client actually had a room that was too long, like it just was, you know, 16 feet wide and it was 36 feet long or 32 feet long. Actually, 32 by 16 would suck. Uh, what you could actually do is say, we're going to shorten the room because it's just a long hallway anyway that's not going to be enjoyable from a picture and sound envelopment point of view like we talked about two sessions ago. Um, but you, you could actually reduce the size of the room by, by actually making a, a panel uh, rather than put uh, solid material. You could actually put a big chunk of fiberglass so build framing and stuff it with that fi that uh, dense fiberglass at a quarter of the front of the room. And then you'll end up with 
no standing waves in the front to back direction at those frequencies uh, and very, very good modal absorption, it's a way to, to, to make things work. Um, instead of using frictional absorption, it's better to use diaphragm absorbers, which is giant drum heads that are custom calculated to resonate at the frequencies uh, where you have a problem. But uh, be careful because while the acoustics books out there, the you know uh, uh, how to build a recording studio for dummies, uh, will mm -hmm. say, oh, here's a here's an equation for how to build this. Here's a diagram for how to build it. It's usually built out of a frame and a wood panel in the front, made out of fire uh, out of plywood. But guess what? That plywood is going to change in its resonance character depending on temperature and humidity. Sure. So one day it's going to resonate at a certain frequency, and the next day it's going to resonate at a different frequency. So the base of your room is going to change from day to day. Mm -hmm. Not acceptable. So this type of base absorber is complicated to build, and it's unreliable. I don't like to do regular diaphragmatic absorbers. Uh, you can also do Helmholtz absorbers, which is a giant resonating bottle, like a giant, uh, imagine building a giant box with a port. The mm -hmm. acoustics books out there, the, uh, you, you can go online, and you can find all kinds of resources for how to design those. Those do work reliably, except that they're very inefficient. The absorption is only over the area of the port, and that may not be enough. If you line the whole front wall of the room with a bunch of these, maybe you'll get somewhere. Um, it's inefficient. Um, out of frustration that it was hard to find a really good deep base absorber, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot something. There, there's a combination of the two, uh, which actually is not visible on this diagram, but imagine building uh, big, uh, what looks like big panel resonators, but actually rather than, than be a flectoral absorber where, where the head is like a drum, you mm -hmm. actually use perforated material that you actually you either get pre-made perforated material or you perforate your own. You can actually calculate this thing to be kind of a broadband base absorber centered on the frequency where you have problems, and you can make those nice and big, and they can be pretty efficient. Uh, those do work. Um, you just have to have a pretty big area of the room. Um, out of frustration that all this stuff was complicated, we end up inventing uh, my, my company about, uh, wow, we're going on to about 12 years ago, 12 to 13 years ago, we invented this thing called a spring trap, which is a combination of a giant uh, pressure diaphragm um, and three Helmholtz resonators all in one box. I've talked about it at an, in, a, in another session, it's called a spring trap. It works really well. Here's its absorption character over frequency. Let's move on. Um, so you can also build the walls of the room to be a little bit flexible. Mm -hmm. So you have standing waves when the room's very stiff, made out of solid concrete or made out of framing with three or four layers of sheetrock, which they do a lot in recording studios for sound isolation. Well, that stiffness is going to make sure that the bass resonates back and forth. If instead of doing that, you build a wall out of studs on 24-inch centers mm -hmm. with half-inch sheetrock only, uh, maybe you put a bit of what's called homosote, which is a, 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 a half-inch, very low-density damping material behind it so that the walls don't ring like, like a drum. Um, sure. You, you can end up with, with walls that are flexible enough, and the, and the, the uh, standing wave resonances just get absorbed or transmitted out by the walls being relatively flexible. Um, you can also build the walls. Oh, so one liability of that kind of design is the base is, is going to the neighbors. So if you have a bedroom to one side, oh, yeah. if you have an office on the other side, you can't really do this. So there is a way to do the best of all worlds on this, which is to build the walls uh, resiliently using an isolator. Uh, there's, I'll show you some pictures, but it's basically a gizmo you put on the stud that is made to receive hat channel. That's a, a strip of metal that looks like a hat when you look at the side. You mount your sheetrock on there, and that mm. does what that does is it blocks the sound from transmitting through the studs to the other side of the wall, but it also makes your wall relatively flexible and mm -hmm. resilient, so you absorb some bass. Um, this is one of the clips you can use called a, the uh, it's called PAC, which is Pacific um, Pacific International RSIC1, and here you see it mounted with its uh, with its channel. That thing that's sitting sideways would normally get put this way onto a wall yeah. mm -hmm. right here. Um, Kinetics Noise Control makes a thing called the Isomax, which is the same kind of concept. Uh, or it's, it does the same thing, it's just built completely differently. There it is with its hat channel piece stuck into it. Put that on the wall, you'll get sound isolation and also some damping of the standing waves. Here's a picture of that. All right. Um, 
Next strategy is don't sit at the standing wave peaks or dips. I showed this diagram, I think, a few times. This mm -hmm. is a kind of a, a little study of showing where the first resonance, second resonance, third, fourth, and fifth resonance standing wave peaks and nulls would be. And if you sit in the middle of the room from front to back, you're going to have a null at the first harmonic, at the third harmonic, and fifth harmonic. The bass is not going to be good there. But if you move back a little bit, instead of being at 0.5 of the room, if you move back to 0.55 of the room, just a little bit, you actually are neither at peaks or dips at different frequencies. Um, so there are, it's what we call the sort of the magic ratio positions. Uh, these are places in the room where the bass will theoretically not stink too bad. Mm -hmm. um, 0.2 of the length of the room, which now you know your face is in the screen. Uh, 0.32, you're still too close to the screen. 0.45, you start to get kind of close to the middle of the room. 0.55, 0.68. So when you're when you're deciding where you put the seat positions, try to have them at these ratios of the length, width, and height of the room. Um, height of the room, of course, you can achieve by um, choosing the height of your seat, and that's also putting risers and doing things so that people don't don't end up at the vertical standing wave nulls. So let's move on. Next, finally, this is what everybody wanted to know, is mm -hmm. just like how many subwoofers, what do I do, what do I do? So um, let's talk about the selection factors. Before you, you decide how many subwoofers you need, Let's talk about what you need. First of mm -hmm. all, you need to, you know, we you need to play down to 20. I'd say minimum, you need to play down to 30 hertz. Uh, there's a lot of people going to go, oh, I already had to go much lower than that. It's like, well, for most people, for most movies, if you can get mm -hmm. down to 30 hertz, most people didn't go, You're wow, good. that's enjoyable. Here's, you know, here's my credit card again for the final payment. Thank you very <laughs> much. I can't wait to have my friends over. <clears throat> um, if you can make it down to 25, even better. If you can make it to 20, man, people are going to love it. If you can make it down to three, wow. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I really do want to I, I do want to check and see if, that, if there's spectrum there. So first of all, bandwidth. Can you make it down to at least 30, preferably 20, 25? Uh, now, there are plenty of subwoofers out there that will play down to 20, but won't play it very loud. So right. uh, you need to make sure you have enough sensitivity in the driver and enough sound pressure level. So it's not just enough to look at the documentation from a manufacturer that says, oh yeah, we play down to 20 hertz. You also want to know, well, how loud can how you loud? play? Yeah. And no one's going to tell you that. Yep, that's the magic, yep. That's the, that's that's the, the magic. Secret. And uh, again, almost at every one of these sessions, I put a plug in for this work we're doing with Encedia to come up with a, a standardized disclosure scheme in which you're going to look at a form. When, when we get done with this, you'll look at the same PDF that you can download from the manufacturer, which is mm -hmm. a sort of the CDA accredited specs disclosure and, and from the CDA website. And dispassionately, without saying whether it's good or bad, you're going to have, here's the bandwidth of this subwoofer at, yep. at 80 dB, which is quiet. Here it is at 90. Here it is at 100. Here mm -hmm. it is at 110. So you can actually know just what the bandwidth of this thing is when it's got to play loud. There's a lot of subwoofer manufacturers that play tricks where they claim 20 hertz, but as you go up in level, they actually restrict the low frequency. So there's actually a high pass filter that as you go up in frequency, pushes the bandwidth up to 40, 50. Mm -hmm. So when it's loud, right when you want everything to be rumbling, because like, ah, it's, yeah, it's just not there. Yeah, it's just not there. That's just not right. And that's the thing you have to do when you're trying to sell a low cost subwoofer that's small. I'm not criticizing that. There's a client for that. It's just that you need to know from the specs that it's going to do it or not do it. So. Mm -hmm. um, when you're deciding what subwoofer, you need to know the sensitivity, the sensitivity, the SPL, the impedance, and the power handling, and then you got to pick out the right subwoofer if it's a passive. Thank goodness, in a lot of subwoofers today, everything is active, so you can mm -hmm. ignore all of these things of of sensitivity and power and all of that. You just got to know how loud does it play. There's another thing I like to know, which is when you get to the peak, when you get to that place where you're you're at the limit of capacity. What happens? So there are subwoofer manufacturers that put overload control on these subwoofers. They put a limiter that you don't even know is working. It mm -hmm. just goes up to the limit, and then it don't play no more. You don't hear any distortion and nothing. And then there's other ones that are not so good at that. They're not so skilled in building the limiters. And when they, they get into limiting, you hear that the subwoofer is just not sounding good anymore. Yeah. And then there's those that don't put limiters at all. And then you hear bam, 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 crunch, crunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, 
in deciding what the subwoofer is going to be, again, you need to know the bandwidth, how loud does it play, and when mm -hmm. it's getting to its limit point, just what does it do? How do you find out? Dude, there's there's no replacing getting the thing in and torturing it. Um, so um, you may also have some dimensional constraints. You may have a, oh, yeah. a client that said, here's the cabinet, you're putting the subwoofer in here. And like, uh, you know what? I was planning on this big room having a 15 inch subwoofer, but this cabinet can only take a 10. What are we gonna do? Yeah. So these are all things you have to know. Um, now, what are we trying to get to? We wanna try to get to at least 100, in, in today's immersive audio, Atmos, super duper, you know, whiz -bang, whiz bang, it's playing really nice and punchy. We wanna play at least 110 dB of bass and preferably 115. That's where it gets exciting. And um, you got to use subwoofers because in order to get to that frequency, that response, if, if you ignored all this business of standing ways we talked about, if you thought that you could put just regular speakers, um, the speakers would have to be huge to play Massive, that amount yeah. of sound pressure level in the bottom two octaves. You'd have to have a speaker with probably dual 15 inch drivers mm -hmm. that, that can take a thousand watts and you know, like it's a big massive speaker. Where do you put those around the room? So it takes a lot of cone area and very careful tuning to get there. So um, in deciding, so I'll say no more about how to pick the subwoofer because that could actually be a, an hour on its own. Oh, sure. We've picked a good subwoofer. Now, I haven't gone there yet, but what you really want, instead of one big subwoofer that can do all that, is you want four. So this mm -hmm. is a spoiler alert. It is four. How many do you need? Four. If you can't do four, three is okay, two is okay, don't do one. So the four need to do together, those four need to be able to play 110 or 115. And that's a lot easier in terms of dimension and placement oh, yeah. than one big, huge 18 inch subwoofer that you don't know where to put in the room. Sure. Because the client's like, wow, you want to put that refrigerator in here? That's not acceptable. So mm -hmm. we're going to use some planning and modeling. We're going to worry about the aesthetics and acoustics. We're going to work on trying to get rid of the room resonances. Um, Multiple subwoofers is always better. You're going to use them in, I call in mono. They're going to play the same signal. Right. And, and you're going to do the placement by measuring the frequency response. Um, and they can also listen, listen to single tone sweeps um, and check and see what the results are. So how does this placement thing change the sound in the subwoofer, in the uh, sound of the subwoofer in the room, when you know the legend is you can put it anywhere? I started off an hour ago. Uh, and by the way, yes, I'm going to go over time again. I'm no, no, no complaints here, my friend. <laughs> I'm going to try not to go to two hours, no, but it's probably going to be an hour and a half. Sorry. That's okay. That is um, okay. So legend way in the beginning, an hour ago. Um, um, if you put a subwoofer at five locations in the room, it's all bad, and they're all different. So right. you can't put a subwoofer anywhere you want. Now, what happens as, as you move the subwoofer in the room? So check this out. I'm going to go back to this diagram, which is mm -hmm. our client sitting three quarters of the way back in the room, starting off with a subwoofer all the way in the front of the room. It's developing a standing wave. Let's pretend like this is a 20 foot room and this is a 50, 50 hertz signal. Uh, and I'm rounding, by the way, it won't be exactly that. Sure. But let's just keep it simple. 20 foot, 50 hertz. Subwoofer's over here. Uh, it's loud here, it's loud there, it's loud there. And right where our, where our client has said, this is where the couch goes, they got no 50 hertz, they're not hearing kick drums, they're unhappy. So check this out. Remember that I said that when there is a standing wave, there's an inversion of the polarity in the room. The actual mm -hmm. developed pressure by the waves going back and forth is gonna be positive here, negative, positive here. Um, if you move the subwoofer to this location here, mm -hmm. where on one side of the dip, the energy wants to be plus and the other side it wants to be minus. When you put the subwoofer there, you're forcing both sides of the null to be going up and down rather than do this. Right. And the resulting sound level, uh, you know, the profile of that sound level is gonna look like this. So your client's gonna go from a 38 dB loss potentially to maybe only a 5 dB loss. There'll still right. be some standing waves. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's all gone. There'll still oh, be yeah. some Way more manageable though. But wow, the guy's gonna go, whoa, I hear the kick yeah. drum, thank you very much. Just by mm -hmm. moving the subwoofer, that was free. Now you have to argue about aesthetics because now this 18 inch subwoofer is like- <laughs> Got to the middle of the room. <laughs> and then what you have to do is you have to leave quickly before there's an argument between the two partners that own this home. Yes. Um, uh, here's another diagram that shows how this works. By the way, this uh, comes out of a Floyd tool created lecture that uh, is part of a Cedia course. So thank you Floyd for putting this out. Um, so this, 
shows the same thing at the first harmonic. This, by the way, is at the second harmonic. This is mm -hmm. what happens at the first harmonic. Subwoofer um, on the back of the room, or actually think of this along the width. Let's just change uh, all these diagrams, everything I've been showing from, from front to back. Now let's pretend you're looking at the room uh, along the length direction. So this is the right of the room, that's the left of the room. When the subwoofer is over here, there's a plus and minus excitation. Well, guess what? When you put the subwoofer in the middle, that is driving those two together. But check it mm -hmm. out. What if you put two subwoofers, yeah. one on either side? So Sounds naturally, balanced. it balances out. Naturally, remember the standing wave wants to create this in the room, mm -hmm. this kind of up and down. But you're doing this with the two subwoofers on the two sides of the room. Suddenly, the standing wave gain is gone. The null's gone. The, the gain's gone. This um, over here is the next phase in this discussion. So. One subwoofer in the corner of the room is about the worst you could do. Mm -hmm. One subwoofer in the front, partway in is, is a bit better, but two subwoofers ends up working a whole lot better because you're contradicting the construction of the standing wave. Anthony, uh, real quick, Michael, uh, Mike has a good question. Um, does any of this change or does any of this matter whether the sub is front firing versus maybe down firing? Um, so what's interesting is uh, y yes and no. Um, if the, uh, at all equal cone locations, it doesn't change, but what's interesting is that um, sometimes very small displacements of the subwoofer can affect its interaction with the chaos of a standing wave. So if you take a subwoofer that's a front firing subwoofer that's pointing this way and, mm -hmm. and you turn it, you actually turn it in the room this way, you've changed the radiation point by maybe eight or 10 inches. And sometimes sure. that's all it takes to, contradicting, to contradict this massive chaos that looks like what I've got in the next slide. Um, I had a recording studio I was doing, I don't know, 12 years ago, in which that's all it took. The recording studio had a single, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a Genelec subwoofer, good subwoofer, and mm -hmm. the standing wave was absolutely horrible. I mean, at the at the main mix position, it was just bad, and there was Ugh. nowhere nowhere to put the subwoofer. It was like, well, let's see if just turning this thing, turning it up, turning it down, can mm -hmm. actually interfere with the the chaos enough, and it did. Uh, that was like a, a, lucky, a lucky day. I should have gone out and bought a lottery ticket because that was actually yeah. uh, lucky. Uh, in most cases, it's not going to be quite so good. So it doesn't have to do with whether it's firing down or mm -hmm. out or up. It just has to do with with changing the radiation point that can, if you're lucky, do enough to change the standing weight. Um, and then Joey asks, talking about putting the two subs in your second example there, Joey asks, does that eliminate the need for base traps? Ah, um, yes and no. Um, so let's go, I don't know how many slides I have to go back. Let's go back to this. Cause that's, that's a good question. What do you need to do? Or oh, it's more slides. This is mm -hmm. the, 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 the group of strategies. So in order to get kick ass bass, which is bass that is tight, punchy, loud at all the seats in the room, you end up with really good bass. Everybody's happy. There's smiles everywhere. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You really need to do all of this. You need to have the right room dimensions. You need some kind of base damping, whether it's done by the walls or base straps. You need mm -hmm. to make sure the seats are not at places that suck. And you need to put the subwoofers at the right location. And you need to tune it all. And I haven't gone there, but I'm going to show you mm -hmm. that. And when once you see what happens when you get to that final stage of tuning, you're going to go, this guy, you're either going to go, this guy is lying because I can't <laughs> believe that I'm sitting here. Or you're going to go, wow, there's more to this than I ever thought. Oh, so sure. ideally, you want to do all of the above, mm -hmm. ideally. Well, if you can't, if you're not allowed to, let's say the client goes, you're not going to change where you put the subwoofer. You're not going to change my seating locations. Hell, if you're changing my room and putting base traps everywhere, forget it. Then you're only left with this. Mm -hmm. um, if that's all you're left with, you can try to tune down maybe a peak here and an all there and do the best you can. If mm -hmm. the only thing you can do is move the subwoofer, well, that's better than nothing. Better than ideally, nothing yep. ideally, it's all five of these things, ideally. And uh, if it, if you have to drop any one of them out, you it just won't be as good. Right. Okay. So uh, back to uh, – good, good question. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, the, the short answer is no. You still want to do some damping of the base energy in the room because that will resolve the variations from seat to seat. And it'll also resolve the, resolve the fact that the, the sub pressure gradients are still not perfect over here. So um, two subwoofers will do this. Um, 
if you look at it over multiple standing waves, so this is one subwoofer. Here you're seeing the first harmonic mm -hmm. coming off that subwoofer. Here you're seeing the second harmonic in the dotted lines. Here is you're seeing the third harmonic in the solid gray line. Uh, Jason, can you see all that? It's kind Absolutely. of small. Absolutely. Yeah, and guys, if, um, if you need to make your screens bigger, guys, you can. You can grab this little slider um, on your screen and you can make Anthony's uh, PowerPoint bigger if you need to. Yeah, it looks, looks good um, on this end. So if you put two subwoofers on either side of the room, you're gonna get rid of the first harmonic and you're gonna get rid of the third harmonic, which is the blue and the solid gray line. Mm -hmm. It won't get rid of the second harmonic, okay? Because there's plus, there's plus driven out of the subwoofer. And in the second harmonic, when you have plus here, you have minus there, you have plus there. So you haven't really helped that. And so how are you gonna help that? You're gonna do something in the other direction that's gonna get rid of the second harmonic, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So um, if you take the subwoofers and you move them into the room somewhat, like over to here, check mm -hmm. out what happens when you put the subwoofers at the quarter point. So this is one quarter and three quarters. Uh, by putting a subwoofer here and a subwoofer here, Mm -hmm. which is right at the place where a plus energy is contradicting a plus and minus uh, construction, you've gotten rid of all of the standing waves. So two subwoofers placed a, a quarter and three quarters of the room into the room mm -hmm. can get rid of, of the width standing waves or the front to back standing waves. And of course is potentially gonna interfere with the aesthetics of the room. I'm just giving you sort of the, what happens in the theory of all of this. And Anthony, would, would it matter here, if you, if you go back yeah, to this diagram, are those are the cones of the subwoofers facing into the room, facing each other? Does that does that even matter? It doesn't matter because at the subwoofer frequencies, the cone is very small compared mm -hmm. to the radi the radiated wavelength. So the device is an omnidirectional radiator. Uh, if you look at the polar pattern of a subwoofer at 50 hertz, it's just a sphere of energy just going in all boom. directions. Got it. Yeah, what's, cool. more, what's more important is at the middle of the cone, the, the actual center of energy be right at that null. That null is very, right very uh, narrow. I mean, it, oh, it yeah, could be peach. just 12 inches. You gotta yeah. be right there in the, in the middle of that null. So it, it, that's sure. what's more important. All right, so from those theoretical diagrams, here's another theoretical diagram, but I'm back to my guy with his red hat, with his blue suit and red Ooh. socks. I love this guy. Um, and um, instead of having one subwoofer at the quarter point, we're going to give him two smaller subwoofers. You know, we're, you, instead of one 15-inch driver, maybe you can do two 12-inch drivers that are going to get the same sound pressure level. You're putting them over here. The standing wave wants to generate plus and minus, but the subwoofers are going to do plus and plus. They're going to they're going to drive that in phase. It's going to reduce the standing wave. Your client will be happier. Okay, so. With all of that in mind, if you extract everything I just talked about, uh, actually, let me go forward. If you looked at everything I just talked about and you put two subwoofers on either side of the room laterally, you're gonna get rid of the first harmonic, third harmonic, fifth harmonic. Mm -hmm. If you put two subwoofer, if you put an added subwoofer in the middle of the room, the second harmonic is gonna get canceled out because this and that are canceling out so look at this diagram over here, mm -hmm. right? So you have a subwoofer in the plus and in the plus. And then there's nothing, you have a construction over here. Imagine taking, I should have just drawn this. You know what? Let's just, oh, can't do that. Okay. Um, next time I do this, I just, it's funny. I've been teaching these lectures for years and years and years. And then suddenly I'm like, dude, I should have a diagram for I, this. Man, I, that happens um, to me every every time I present. I'm like, oh, I need to add this to the PowerPoint <laughs> every time. Um, I actually have I have a slide at the end of every PowerPoint, I, like afterwards at the end. Thank you very much. When yeah. I write that, so next time I do that. So yeah, imagine go. taking two more subwoofers of these same ones and putting them right here. Mm -hmm. So we have this is good. We've gotten rid of the standing waves for the first harmonic and the third harmonic, but the second is still here and the fourth will still be here. Imagine you take one more subwoofer, stick it over here, another subwoofer, stick it here. Now you have plus, 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 when that's plus, minus, plus. And magically you get rid, by doing this, you get rid, by putting these four subwoofers, you get rid of the first, the second, because now you have two subwoofers and two subwoofers on opposing polarities. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The third, because you got one here and there, and the fourth, because you again, you're this energy and that energy that are both plus are contradicting that energy that wants to be minus, but it's plus here. I hope you followed me through all this. Plus and oh, minus. totally. Yeah. A little crazy. So um, this uh, this works magic. Todd Wealthy arrived at this not by this plus minus conversation. He arrived at this by this really complicated MATLAB co computations and analysis and all this stuff, and went, hey, here's a solution that works well, and mm -hmm. then. You know, I tried it. It was like, wow, look at that. The base is really good. It's wonderful. That's funny. Uh, Chris Chris <laughs> says, this was also THX recommendation to place four subwoofers either in the corners or in the center of the four walls. Right. So, yeah. so, so to be fair, to be fair to my alma mater, uh, the, again, the guy who came up with this, Todd Welty, did it by unbelievable amounts of math that, that earned mm -hmm. him a PhD. Um, so that's all it takes to get a PhD is tons and tons and yeah, tons and tons and tons of math. Just then you got to write this dissertation. You have to defend it. And everybody's poking you know, at you going, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You have to defend it. I'm right until they realize, sure. okay, you're right. Um, so this is a really, really good solution if you want very smooth base with very little change from seat to seat. So in this mm -hmm. room, whether you sit here, oops, uh, whether you sit here or here or here or here, the base is going to be smooth and even and is not going to change. Mm -hmm. However, this... Uh, layout, and I've done it many, many times, um, doesn't play very loud. It actually, uh, if you look at the the sensitivity or the power ratio of this, it's not very efficient. And Todd had this other solution, which is very slightly inferior in terms of evenness of response. So in this room, if you put, you take those same four subwoofers and you put them in the corners, where by the way, it's a lot easier to hide them. Um, the base is a little less smooth here, and there's a little bit more variation from seat to seat. But the sound pressure you get is, I'm going to say it's, a, it's 5 or 6 dB louder, if I remember right. In theory, because actually in Todd's uh, uh, Audio Engineering Society paper that you can you know download and read, he's, he's giving all these mathematical computations of what the gain factors are. It's either 5 or 6 dB louder, which is four times the power. Yeah, right, right. If you actually wanted to get back 5 dB, you'd have to put amplifiers a four times more powerful. So mm -hmm. that's not quite as smooth. But if you do this next thing I'm going to talk about, you can make this work unbelievably well, very smooth by using equalization. So this is a great solution, and this is the one we practice 99% of the time. This is a really good solution that we used to do, but we found it just took way too much subwoofer cone area. Mm -hmm. This is another solution that works well. If you can only do two subwoofers, put them at this halfway point because at mm -hmm. least you'll get rid of the standing waves that are going this way, or you can put them here. You'll get rid of the standing waves that are going in the other direction. It's better than doing nothing. So somebody had asked a question, I think on the last session, is if you had just two subwoofers, where, you, where would you put them? Um, <laughs> Anthony, literally in the question box right now is, what's the best location for two subs? <laughs> two subs. So um, two subs with one here and one here, getting back to this diagram, is quite good. So quarter point from the left, quarter point from the right in the front wall, that actually gets rid of the left to right standing waves quite well. Doesn't do anything for your front to back standing waves. So this guy... Mm, Wow, I can't get there from here. What's going on? So if you put two subwoofers on the front wall at a quarter and three quarters of the room, you'll get rid of the left to right standing waves, but this guy's not still not going to be happy because at 50 hertz, he's still going to have his standing wave from front to back. Just mm -hmm. warning. So that that can work. It's better. It's much better than have, having just one subwoofer, but putting two subwoofers like this at the midpoint gets rid of the first harmonic and the third harmonic of the standing waves. If you do this, it's going to get rid of the second, uh, I'm sorry, I want to be clear. This gets rid of the standing waves left to right of the first harmonic and third harmonic, and it also gets rid of the standing waves from front to back that have dips right here. So this harmonic is going to get rid of you, so the first and third. So this placement gets rid of first and third and the, along the width direction and the length direction. So this is good, that's good too. Okay, it's a little bit unorthodox to see those subwoofers there. I've done tons of rooms where that's where they are, as long yeah. as you cross them over at 80 or 90 hertz, which is that your your speakers can play good and low, you know, low enough and the standing waves in the room above that aren't too strong, it works really well. Okay? Um, and, and, and all so, these diagrams, you have everything like exactly at half points and stuff. Um, 
Uh, Rajdeep had a follow-up question to his question about two subs. What about quarter width and quarter length? Um, so one of the solutions in this in the Todd Welty paper is actually I used to have it in this in this presentation, but I took it out so that it wouldn't take three hours. But is mm -hmm. actually quarter here, mm -hmm. quarter here, quarter here, quarter here. So quarter the way in the room at four points. And mm -hmm. we've done that many times in rooms where we actually put subwoofers on the ceilings. Sure. So in ceiling subwoofers, again, a, a, a bunch of different companies makes things that are small enough and shallow enough that you can hide them up there, mm -hmm. either by going through the sheetrock or just suspending them from there. Um, quarter points up there are actually the smoothest results. So if you look at Todd Welty's paper in the rating of performance, this one that's here is the second best, the one that has the, um, the subwoofers at the midpoints. The best one was quarter points front to back and left to right. So again, if, if this, actually I'll go over here. Hey, I'll do this live and in person. So subwoofer here, subwoofer here. I'm not gonna turn them because I don't have time, but if you can imagine that being all quarter points, that actually right. in, in Todd's analysis and actually in our findings is the smoothest response, least variation from seat to seat, pretty good modal gain, that's a great solution. It's just aesthetics get in the way. So sure. um, you, you can do this, uh, that works too. Um, and, or you can do this, you can do that. There's a bunch of choices. Yeah. Um, I would highly recommend that you download the Todd Welty paper that is on the Harman International website. There's a paper that's sort of a, an audio engineering society dissertation for dummies, or you <laughs> just go to the AES and pay the whatever it is, five or 10 bucks to download his AES paper. If you have insomnia, I, I guarantee it's gonna cure oh. it immediately. Um, and, and if it doesn't cure it, you'll have read a really interesting paper with a lot of math. So now let's get back to uh, where we started this whole thing, which is um, our subwoofer at left center and right locations. Remember how this was all bad. This like mm -hmm. sucked, right? This is the room we talked about way in the beginning where our left speaker had big peak dip here, 38 dB. The center uh, was 28, I think, and then 20 over here. And uh, let's take the same room and put four subwoofers in the corners. Mm -hmm. This Ooh. is the same room, four subwoofers in the corners. Wow. Now, what I'm showing here, I'm sorry. So uh, this is one microphone measurement at the mm -hmm. main seat location, three different subwoofer positions. Okay, so they're way different. Mm -hmm. This is four smaller subwoofers. Um, so instead of having one big triad with a 15 inch driver, uh, it was four. Like four uh, tens maybe. Four tens, the triad bronze in room, in room bronze that has an aluminum cone. It's mm -hmm. a, again, another, it sounds like I'm working for a triad over here. I don't, <laughs> I actually run a company that's competitive of theirs, but I give, I give due plugs to the people who do good work. Sure. Okay, and Triad has consistently done really nice product. Um, that's why you know I support them. So four Triad bronzes in the room, in the four corners, now measured at, at a few different seat locations. So at the main seat location, um, which was, um, I am remembering that the red is the is the seat location we're looking at before, but remember how horrible it was. Now mm -hmm. what we have between 10 hertz and 100 hertz is results that are pretty smooth with a yep. peak over here, a bit of a dip. This is on a 5 dB range. That's only five, yeah. So the error is 12 dB peak to peak, way smoother, okay? Same room, same everything, four, four drivers. Now, um, Summary of all of this is four is best, two is okay, experiment a lot because um, the all of the things I mentioned in terms of these locations all assume even standing waves in the room. Well, they're not even. I showed mm -hmm. you right in the beginning that the standing waves from the left subwoofer, are actually I'm pointing in your direction, mm -hmm. so from my direction, the left subwoofer and the right subwoofer locations had different standing waves. So sometimes um, if you have a pair of subwoofers, it may not be directly front to back and left to right, you may actually find that displacing them a little bit can get you better base. So expect direct, drastic improvements from experimenting and using multiple subwoofers. Mm -hmm. Now, the last strategy here is tuning. 
Uh, tuning is not just another city in China. It's an essential mm -hmm. thing you need to do with subwoofers. And a follow-up work from Todd Welty and his uh, colleague Alan Devantier showed what happens if you actually do some things with time optimization, EQ, and level. And that is really, really cool. It's like the next phase. So the tuning process should be done with a decent analyzer, good microphone, and, and um, multiple microphone locations. Don't just tune at one position. Um, you should use either impulse response or FFT, ETC. All of this stuff is available essentially free from Room EQ Wizard. Um, and the first step of tuning after you've placed either your two subwoofers or your four subwoofers, wherever you've done them, is to experiment with the inter-subwoofer delay. So inter-subwoofer delay. I, I want to say, hey, you want to start a band that's called Inter Subwoofer Delay? Yeah, that, that'd, be, that'd be a good one. There'd be like eight people would understand that. <laughs> yeah. And it, like, we'll all play the bass guitar. Yeah, we'll all play bass, yeah. <laughs> um, next thing you're going to do in the tuning is you're going to set the levels of the four subwoofers. And then if you can, you're going to set EQ of the four subwoofers differently. So how you do that, let's, uh, let's, let's get into that. Um, I'm going, just going to... Z zoom through this and not talk about this. Uh, let's move forward. Let's move forward. Let's move forward because I want to show you these diagrams. So um, the first step in the inter subwoofer delay is uh, is trying different combinations of delay. You can you can actually do this through analysis uh, and modeling uh, if you have the impulse response of the four subwoofers, which you can do with Room EQ Wizard. You can plug them into some optimization programs, and the program's going to come back and say, you know, you should try delaying this subwoofer by two milliseconds. You should try changing the level of that one by 5 dB. You can do all of that. If you don't have time for that, or if you don't have the knowledge, you can just start try changing things. And if you have a four-channel EQ for your subwoofer, you can say, well, let's see what happens if I delay the two back subwoofers by two milliseconds. Mm -hmm. and let's see if I delay them by four. Let's see what happens when I delay them by six and then eight. Um, if there's no effect, or if it gets worse, you can try delaying the fronts. If there's no effect, you can try delaying the lefts if you're mm -hmm. using four subwoofers. So do, you can try some trial and error. It doesn't take very long. So uh, there are plenty of EQs out there in the market. They start as cheap as about $150 to $200 for a good mm -hmm. four-channel EQ, and they go up into the multi-thousand dollars. Uh, you know, pick one. It's subwoofer frequencies. You don't need to get too obsessive about the, mm -hmm. the purity of the digital path. They, they'll work fine. So start off by trying two milliseconds or try the front subwoofers, try individual subwoofers, uh, and, and you can do this predictive, predictive analysis with impulse response. Harman does have some programs they, they've developed and you can, you can uh, source from them. So what I do when I'm, when I'm delaying this thing is I look at the frequency response using, let me go back to this diagram, I shortcut it really quickly. When I'm doing this, as I said, four microphones in the room, at the you know generalized seat locations, and they're plugged into what's called a multiplexer, which is a switcher that goes microphone one for a second, microphone two for a second, microphone three for a second, microphone four for a second, then wraps back. And the output of that goes into an analyzer that's looking at a, uh, in my case, an FFD uh, long window analysis, and you, and you're looking at what the re measured responses. You change the delay and you look at the effect. You change the delay, you look at the effect, but not just at one microphone, you are averaging over four mics. So you go around the room, you're looking at the thing, you're looking at the analyzer and there's a point at which you're gonna go, hey, wait a minute, the bass is getting better if, if everything is going right. Um, my experience so far is that 80% of the time, which is substantial, you're gonna get an improvement by setting the inter subwoofer delay. Um, and the improvement could just be 2 dB at 30 hertz, it's worth it, mm. or it could be 12 dB at 30 hertz. Shit, that's worth it. Yeah. Pardon my French. That's huge. Which would be mailed. <laughs> um, so um, let's look at that. Is that real? Is that not real? I'm noticing my picture's gone dark again. Uh, yeah, I think, I'll keep uh, going. I'm, I'm like slowly becoming the ghost back here. Yeah, I think you might have a bandwidth issue too, because your uh, it looks like it lowered your 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 bit rate yeah. a little bit. That's okay. Give me a quick second here. Yeah, uh, we still hear. We can no, still it's hear not okay. Fine. Sorry. <laughs> just hit one button. Check this out. Boom! I'm back. Yeah, bright again. One of these the, days, uh, I'm actually going to figure out what <laughs> it is that causes that to do this. Um, 
Yeah, I think I know what it is. In the camera control, there's an auto exposure oh, yeah. that turns on and off randomly. Yeah. There it is. And I have no idea why it would just turn on. Maybe, I'm sure there's somebody that's listening that knows all about that. Yeah, Thank you, probably, please yeah. tell me in Windows, why does, why does the auto exposure on the camcorder yeah, go it's funny. like that? All okay. these, all these uh, streaming and webinar programs, we've all, everybody's just kind of had to learn them on the fly recently, <laughs> you know, just sort of just playing yeah. with it a lot. Yeah. No, that's okay though. Um, okay, back to this program. So, uh, da, 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 da. Um, so remember this? This was that room, single yep. subwoofer, peak yep. to peak errors of, 38 mm -hmm. dB, remember this, oh, um, this is what, what happens when you put four subwoofers in the room before and after inter-subwoofer tuning. So in green is the four subwoofers averaged over four microphones. That was a response. Now I've, exp I've expanded the, the measurement up to mm -hmm. 500 hertz so that it matches this data, right? So remember before we had this giant peak dip Irrecoverable, by the way. You can't push that up enough to gain that 52 hertz back. It just won't work. Mm -hmm. um, so we put four subwoofers in the room. Now the response is this green line on average. Um, it's not perfect. You know, we have a peak over here at uh, 38 hertz. It's, it's just a whole lot better than it used to be. Um, now, by using delay, I'm sorry, I miss. So the, the, the sort of mustard color, the brownish mustard color, is what happens with just the four subwoofers playing equally. So there's a peak at 67 hertz, a dip over here, et cetera, et cetera. Not bad. Actually, you could just say, fine, I'll EQ this peak down, fine. Mm -hmm. um, but check what happens. You actually apply, in this case, four, uh, four milliseconds of delay to the back subwoofers. And, yep, to the back subwoofers particular room. So again, this is this smallest room at 16 feet long, four triad bronze, 10 inch driver, 300 watts each, uh, three or 400 watts each, two in the front, two in the back, delay the backs by four milliseconds. Look at how this changed. Mm -hmm. So we went from this over here that was brownish. Um, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute my camera because I can tell the bandwidth's going yeah, to hell. Yeah, I'll turn mine there. off for, for now too um, while you're going through the slides. There you go. Um, We'll so turn it back on again. Just this to over say here bye to everybody. is the okay. Uh, we'll we'll be back, like they say. Uh, I'll be back. Um, <laughs> this is the this four subwoofers, much better than before with the single subwoofer. This is four subwoofers with four milliseconds delay. It's changed. It's pulled this peak down and it's raised this peak up. Is that better? Oop, Anthony, we may have lost you. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. That's better, because check there. it out. Right at 35 hertz, where it's really hard to get a lot of poop out of a 10-inch driver, we suddenly got ourselves 7 dB. Let's actually put a equalizer in there. But you didn't have to, version power, you to do anything other than tune them. So what do we do with this? We're, we're going to put an equalizer on this. We're going to turn this down a bit. The subwoofer down by 6 dB, you gained yourself a whole ton of extra headroom. So this system on C, uh, when, when uh, uh, tanks are running into walls and explosions are going on, it's going boom, crash, boom, crash. This subsystem is going to play between 4 and 5 dB louder than before we tuned it, just because we got that extra 6 dB of head at 36, the 36 hertz that we've turned down. And then down here, it's a little less smooth. We're going to push this up. We're going to smooth this out and then put a crossover somewhere over here. This is going to be amazingly tight 10 inch subwoofers. Okay. So let's look at another room. And I've got, mul I've got data for days on this. I'll just do a few. This is theater number two. So th this was the first the first one I'm talking about. This is our our, our continued experiment room. This is a you know a client's room um, in green. In blue is is the response of the subwoofer. 
subwoofers, four subwoofers put in the room as original. Yep, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, sorry, Anthony. Uh, the, okay. the last couple uh, so, of seconds, Jason, are you still there? We, kind of, we kind of lost you those last couple seconds. Yeah, I could oh, tell. There you um, go. I'm back. back. Okay, there you go. Oh, it's muting in and out. Wow. Um, so interestingly enough, there's a big rainstorm where I am right now. Just kind of kind of came out of nowhere, and uh, the bandwidth just went to hell. There you go. <laughs> um, so in in blue is four subwoofers put in this other room. You know, it's not great, but it's not really bad. The peak to peak error over here is. Uh, at 25 hertz, this is 82 and a half. We're going up to 92. So there's a 10 dB peak to peak error. If you wanted to smooth this down, you could just knock this down and push this up, whatever. There isn't a giant dip. This is always measured with four microphones. It's a spatial average. And then we add eight milliseconds of delay, in this case to the front subwoofers, if I'm reading, oh no, back delay. And look at what happened here. We gained ourselves four dB at 22 hertz out of this package of subwoofers. 3 dB would doubly would be doubling the power. 4 dB is like, you know, call it two and a half times more power. So we got a bunch of free extent of low frequency um, and more headroom. What we do with this green curve once we've done it is we put one band of EQ, flatten that out. You got really smooth bass, plus and minus one or two dB, all of that by just doing a delay or by changing the delay between the subwoofers. Number three. Uh, um, in, in green, actually, so let me read this correctly. Blue, uh, blue was the response. Uh, I'm sorry, red was the original response. Green is when we applied five milliseconds of delay. So here, unfortunately, we didn't did, didn't get extra energy in the in the bottom octave. Instead, we got energy over here. That's worth it, whatever. And then in and we're going to equalize that down. We're going to keep pushing that down to where things are flat. So here we got a little bit of extra energy, but we got 12 dB more at 67 hertz. That's worth it, you know, that extra energy. So again, nice, yeah. before equalizing in red over here at 67, 67 hertz, we had a dip. We equalized up. That's 12 dB up. That's totally worth it. I know it's not the, the low kind of, rattle the room around base, but this is the where the main grunt of most of the energy, the stuff that kind of moves your chest around uh, is, that's worth it. So here's another room, uh, theater number four. So red is the original subwoofers. So again, four subwoofers. We have a response over here that's going up and down. Um, you know, not catastrophic. This is 90, this is 88, that's 84. So we have about 15 dB errors. Um, by applying by applying delay, we got 6 dB more at 23 hertz. So check this out. Right down, here, red was before delay, and uh, green was after delay, blue delay, and EQ. So check this out. This whole region just went up. So I, I want to be clear about this. I'm not changing the level of the subwoofers as I'm applying delay. I'm just applying the delay and observing how the response is changing in the room. So here, yeah, this of course got better. You know, this is a lot smoother, but big benefit down here. The subwoofer system is going to play infrabase a lot louder because we got ourselves 6 dB more. And then we can equalize all that. So blue is what happens after the inter subwoofer delay and EQ. This all fits in a 2 dB window. Oh my goodness, it's a beautiful thing. Um, theater number five. So this is a room and we're starting in red with no EQ, no delay. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Yeah, so red is the original curve. So, uh, great. it's, you know, plus and minus several dB. Uh, blue is what happens when we apply seven milliseconds of delay in the back. Wow, all of these are actually, we're lucky, these are all from the back. Sometimes it's the front channel, sometimes it's the left, sometimes it's the it's the right, it's hard to know. So by applying delay, we got ourselves 6 dB more energy at 30 hertz. Wow, again, four times the power is what that would take. A lot, yeah. In blue, we're gonna equalize that out to smooth it out, and there you go. So um, this is all really nice. Now, this is the clencher, this is the one that was amazing. So um, relatively, actually very cool room, Bonus room in a house at the top of a stairway on the way out to a to a roof deck. Decided to put a little theater up there. 
really comfy, really cozy, four triad bronze uh, in-ceiling subwoofers, was not playing loud at all. The bass was puny, was ane anemic. Everybody's like, oh, these are too small. These subwoofers. Well, um, in red is before uh, tuning the delay. In green is what happens afterwards. The entire region, starting at about 40 or 45 hertz, all the way up to about 90, got pushed up with with a 12 dB gain in the mid band over here, around 57 hertz. That's huge. That's a lot, yeah. And um, so this is how much gain you get. So granted, from 20 hertz to 40 hertz, there's not a lot of energy. Granted, it's uh, it's a relatively big open space. Uh, the drivers are a little too small to really drive all of the cubic volume over there. What we did with this is push this all down, crank the gain up so that the difference between 30 hertz and about 50 hertz isn't as big. The client was very happy. Uh, it's not low in for bass that can play three hertz, but given the conditions, it was nice and solid and, and happy. So this, interestingly enough, is that same room, but with incrementing delay, sorry, so you can see it. So this is starting here at zero millisecond two, four, uh, two, four, six, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, this is in one millisecond. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't know. I forget what I did over here, but this is incrementing up. And you can see as you're, you're telling the equalizer, okay, change the delay of this group of subwoofers. You can see it's going up, 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 up. So um, in the tuning process, you're going to set the inter subwoofer delays. Um, and I've talked about that plenty. Uh, we don't have time for this. This is just an equalization chart of what happens after that. So you, you tune the inter, inter subwoofer without EQ just to see where you can get the best, best result. And then you apply EQ. This happens to be the chart off an Ashley EQ uh, showing, hey, here is a result of the, the, the data uh, correction afterwards. So uh, we're not going to talk about this. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, we don't have time to talk about the cross, crossover. I'll just say, hey, at the, at the end of this whole process, you have to set the, the crossover um, so that it's the splice between the subwoofers and the speakers is the smooth as possible. And that's actually selecting the frequency, the slope of it, if that's available. Some, some of the upper and surround decoders give you the choice of crossover slope and then uh, choose the polarity that gives you the smoothest uh, response to the crossover. At the end of all this, I hope you brought your ears mm -hmm. and you're going to do some listening because that's in the end what's going to tell you that this whole thing is working or not. A lot of people just rely on the microphones of the automated system and they never listen and you know you don't know if the thing worked out. So um, this is uh, this is that room after a full response, a full equalization and everything. Um, the base is intentionally lifted up from the mid-range. This has actually been found by the work of actually uh, uh, of Dr. Floyd Toole and his acolytes uh, with Sean Olive, Todd, and other people have found that this is a good target curve to, to have in a room. This is the response of that little room after we tuned the four subwoofers, got really smooth. There was a little accident here at around 280 hertz that we couldn't correct because of the distance between the speaker and the front wall. This is just the, the center speaker and the four subwoofers. But this is full. This is a response that the client's going to go, it just sounds really good. So um, conclusion of all this is when you're trying to think of what subwoofers and where to put the subwoofers, you have to think more globally that it's an overall management of the base. Um, and you have to think that there's a multi-step process in managing the base. I call that base management. This was actually a, a trademark way back in the THX days that everybody's been using. First step is you want to take control of the standing waves. Uh, you want to treat the room uh, by choosing the right room proportions, by um, choosing the right seating position, by choosing the solutions of the subwoofer, by doing some level of damping, absorption, trapping, whatever you, call, you want to, and equalization. Um, in the end, you'll end up with smoother bass, less deviation across the seats. This is really, really important. It's not good enough for it to sound really good at one seat. It's got to sound good at multiple seats in the room. And in the end, what you're going to notice, if you don't understand frequency, you'll just notice that the bass is punchy and tight, 
and even and strong. And when there's like impacts from exploding sounds, you feel like it's rattling through the room. When you're listening to kick drums, it sounds like it's hitting you in the chest, just like when you're going to a rock concert outdoors. Um, so that's how many subwoofers? Four, put them correctly in the room, treat the room, everything will be good. If you guys need to reach me, here's my contact info. Um, and uh, feel free to put more questions onto the um, um, onto the question box there at AV Pro. Yeah, uh, there's. Thank you for for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, there there were a couple of uh, really good questions here, uh, sort of at the end. Joey asked when we were talking about putting the four uh, subwoofers uh, at the quarter positions or at the halfway positions or whatnot. Um, he asked, and I think you actually got to this at some point. Uh, he said, "Can you put?" If you're doing quarter points, can you just put them all on the ceiling? And I think you said yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of people are like, hey, ceiling, you can't put bass there. Bass is, no, 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 bass doesn't know that it's going down or up. You know, right. they, uh, okay, I forget at where I am in, in the number of legends I'm trying to dispel. Um, <laughs> right. Bass does not know that it's on the floor or on the ceiling. A lot of people think that a subwoofer has to be on the floor for the bass to radiate up. No, it don't know nothing. It's yeah. it's just radiating in the room. So you can put right. subwoofers on the ceiling, you can put them on the floor. They will be different standing waves depending on where you put them, of course. Sure. It is going to be different, but there's there's no reason why the ceiling would be any better or any worse. It's it's a perfectly fine place to put it. However, Good. however, hold on. There's always more. <laughs> There's always more. If you put subwoofers in the ceiling and the projector is hanging from the ceiling on a pole, that ceiling's going to rattle. And on big bass yes. things, you're going to see the, the screen the go like this. Around. So now you have yeah. to suspend the projector so that it's not rattling. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we, we, a lot of times too, we talk about in class with uh, just kind of similar to that note, at least, you know, screens that motorize down. You know what happens when the AC kicks on the screen? <laughs> the screen blows back and forth, and your picture yeah. goes a little bit. So it's, it, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's it, that's good. Um, Michael asks, does setting subwoofer delays have anything to do with their distance from the location of the main channels, or is delay 100% relating to um, to evening out the bass response in the room? So he's he's talking about microphone placement when you're doing the uh, subwoofer delay. Yeah, that's a. Uh, it's uh, the majority of it is all about correcting. I'm just, I'm just going to say taking advantage of the standing wave interactions in the room. So it's about mm -hmm. su it's about subwoofer and room. Um, then at the end of this whole process, you are going to need to do a splice, a crossover splice to the speakers. And right. all the sub this is this is a challenging process. Um, you may actually need to take all of the subwoofers in, in there, you know, with their inter subwoofer delays, and move them all up and back so that mm -hmm. the splice is even. The most crude part of the splice is to change the polarity of the subwoofer and all subwoofers have a plus minus control sometimes they have a phase control um, but you you may actually have to advance and delay all the subwoofers together now that they're all scaled uh, so that they uh, the interaction between the subwoofer and the speaker matches and that's a whole other thing gotcha gotcha um, Jerry says uh, in previous talks you said it took three days to EQ a room how much EQ time should you dedicate just for subs? Four hours for that that whole thing I just described with the multiple subwoofers is a yeah. four or five hour, four hour deal. Yeah, that sounds like. Go, oh my sure. god, four hours! It's like, dude, you want the base? You want forty percent of the sound quality <laughs> to be there? Put the four hours into it. Um, Sam says uh, he ha he has a question for you. For this is probably just a, out of personal experience, I think. But Sam asks, what is the best seat to seat difference that you've ever achieved? So the least amount of deviation. I guess the least amount. Of, yeah, from seat to seat. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine you've had a couple of rooms in your in your past where you've uh, you had your four microphone. You take the readings, and maybe because the room was just done really, really, really well, you know the 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 graphs all kind of line up to each other, and you're like, wow, this is four different mics, four different seating positions, and they're all fantastic. Yeah, sure my first happening. reaction is, oh my my god, my multiplexer is broken. Something's broken. Awesome. Yeah, it's too good. Um, yeah, <laughs> never got to that good. I I would say I I seen you know between the four microphones. Um, by the way, when when I'm doing this, I I look at both the the free running multiplexer taking the average of the four mics, but I also look at the individual response of the mics for that same for that very sure. reason. I want to see how things are. I think I have seen three or four dB differences. So where the frequency response difference between the the four microphones was as little as three dB, which mm -hmm. in uh, in what we're talking about is nothing. It's it's like right. barely audible. Sure, sure. R very rare. Most times, it's differences 
I, I would say 10 dB is not uncommon. Good, good. Uh, well, guys, uh, that, that looks like that's it for the questions. I'm pretty sure I, I've got all the questions that you guys had typed in. Thank you so much for the questions. If I did miss any, I'll go through them uh, this afternoon. And if I did miss any, we'll reach out to you guys uh, individually. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much. Enjoy your you. rest of your week. And uh, we'll see you guys next Monday. And forgive me, I forget the topic we're doing next Monday. Do you remember off the top of your head? I forget. I don't know that we talked about it. I, I think we left it open. Um, we well, we okay. got a bunch of good ones. Yeah, so, we have a surprise. bunch to pick from. Yeah. So yeah, guys, yeah. stay tuned. Uh, watch out the AV Pro and Meridia websites and also the Facebook pages and things. We'll have the registration up for next week's class. Uh, again, Anthony, thank you so much. If there's no more questions, I don't see any more coming in, guys. Uh, we filled out a, almost a full two hours. So excellent. excellent oh, my session. goodness. I mean we yeah. did it again. We did it again. So, uh, <laughs> Anthony, right. you, you had your uh, info up on the screen a moment ago in case people want to get a hold of you. If you guys have any questions for me at all or you want me to um, get any questions to Anthony, feel free anytime, jason at avproglobal.com. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, I think all of you guys for sitting again to another two hours of this blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, and thank you, AV Pro, for putting this on. I really appreciate it. Great. Awesome, guys. Well, there's Anthony's info on the screen, and we will see you next time.